good morning and welcome. It's been a great time in the presence of the Lord. We recently uh, took part as a church in a short time of fasting. Uh, it probably was the, the shortest time period that I have ever fasted, but it w has also turned out to be one of the most significant for me personally uh, that I could have ever imagined. And I want to delineate for you today just the strongest impression that I received during this time with the Lord. And I want to begin with Isaiah chapter 66, verse number 2. This is God speaking, the people I treasure most. That's a powerful statement right there. The people I treasure most are the humble. They depend only on me, and they tremble when I speak. Or, as one translation says, they have great respect for what I say. It's very obvious here that God is speaking to the heart. He's going to the heart, to the secret place, to the inner man. He's going to ground zero. That's what he's speaking about. He is getting past all of the veils and the masks and the coverings and the cloaks and all of the personal agendas and the secret motives and all of the fakery He's gone down all beneath that, and he is declaring to us what I treasure most are those that have great respect for what I say. Those who walk in awe and in reverence of me. This is an interesting concept. The fact that God would say the people that I treasure most. When we talk about respect before the Lord, it possibly could mean something like this. Willing to be schooled in how to handle the holy. Willing to be trained in how to treat the things of God willing to be instructed in how to behave around the glory. The Old Testament priests were meticulously trained on how to handle the holy thing. They were taught, this you can touch, this you cannot touch, this you can enter, that you cannot enter. This you can go into. This you can handle. This over here you cannot handle. In other words, they were taught, I can do this, but I probably shouldn't do that. I can step into this, I belong here, but not here. You see, there are places where my eyes belong and there are places where my eyes don't belong. There are places where my hands belong and places where they don't. Places where my feet and my heart belong. Places where my desires belong, but also places where they don't. There was a king in the Old Testament who never learned this, much to his chagrin and his demise. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse, chapter 30, verse number 3, it's a lament from Agur, actually not written by Solomon, but by a man by the name of Agur. And he said, I haven't learned wisdom, and I don't know the things the Holy One knows. What a lament. Some other versions of that say, I don't have the knowledge of holy things. 
the knowledge of the holy or the burden of the holy one. And this one especially, I don't know the science of saints. Wow. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, there was a king. Verse number 16, his name was Uzziah. The Bible says Uzziah was so powerful that he became proud. Oh, he had so much anointing, so much ministry, so much ability, so much authority, so much power that he became proud. That caused him, the Bible says, to lose his power. Can you imagine? To carry that much anointing and then to lose it. How? He began to turn away from the Lord his God. And what did he do? He went into the Lord's temple to burn incense on the special altar there. The priests, by the way, there were 80 of them, went rushing into the temple and warned King Uzziah. They said to him, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to offer incense to the Lord. So you must leave this holy place. You're where you don't belong. You're out of order. And then it says this, because you have done something that is wrong. As a result, the Lord will not give you any honor. Oh, because you have chosen not to honor Him. He will not honor you. So they quickly took him out of the temple. There is a scripture in Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. It is what I call a God question. The best questions in the Bible are God questions. They are the most soul searching questions of all. The very first God question in the Bible doesn't take long. Genesis chapter 3, where are you? It's a great question has nothing to do with location, has everything to do with condition. Malachi 1.6, here is a God question. A son honors a father, a servant honors his master. But if I'm a father, where is my honor? Or if I'm a master, where is my respect? Now, we could take a pause here and say, Pastor Buddy, does this really matter all that much? Well, there's something that we should consider, and it is this. People in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, lost their lives for mishandling the things of God. Old Testament and New Testament, it crosses the Testaments. Just as it was in the Old, so was it in the New. Eve handled something that didn't belong to her, the tree of knowledge. That was not hers. God never gave her or Adam that tree. He said, you stay away from that tree. That tree did not belong to the devil. It belonged to God. And they took what was God's. And creation fell. And man fell. And his dominion was gone. David had a friend who was sitting on a cart carrying the ark of God. He very innocently put his hand back to steady the ark, but he handled what was not his to handle. And he died, the Bible says, before the ark, in the midst of the presence of God. There were some men in a place called Beth Shemesh, when the ark was returned to Israel. 1 Samuel 6, 19, here's what the Bible says, God fatally struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh. Now these men had just been praising God. They had just been rejoicing. They just had an amazing worship service because the ark had returned. He fatally struck some of them because they looked into the ark of the Lord. It wasn't theirs to open. The message says they irreverently peek. I don't know whether to cry or laugh when I read that. They irreverently 
And we could also add, perhaps innocently, although they knew better, they peeped. Peter had a friend. Peter lost a friend in church, Ananias. He lost, he touched what was not his. He held what was not his. He handled what was not his. And the Bible says he fell down dead. And as they're carting him off, his wife followed him to the cemetery as well, horizontally. It is a big deal. King Herod, not the Herod that died before Jesus was born, not the Herod that Jesus faced, but a King Herod in Acts chapter 12, verse number 23, at once an angel from the Lord struck him down. Herod is giving an oration, and he is receiving glory for this oration. And people are saying he is speaking like a god. And at once, notice that, at once, an angel from the Lord struck him down. And this is, by the way, New Testament. Struck him down because he took the honor that belonged to God. Later, Herod was eaten by worms, and he died. I think we can assume that there are ways to treat holy things. There are ways. There are places where I belong and places where I don't belong. And I want to give you today very briefly the ABCs. Of respect an A a B and a C Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12 the Bible says on judgment day I'll find and punish those who think God doesn't do anything good or bad he isn't involved so neither are we you see the impression is that I'm okay I can handle what I shouldn't, and I'm okay. Nothing happens to me. I don't do it all the time. Here they are. Number one, approach. Respect can be seen in approach. Have you noticed we live in a world where there is a casual approach to almost everything. What does casual actually mean? Not as in business casual. The way that we present ourselves today as a people, as a nation, is a reflection of a spirit in our nation, which is a very casual spirit. Casual means without much thought, without much consideration or concern. It can mean indifferent, a bit indifferent, a bit apathetic, a bit nonchalant, just a little bit sort of lukewarm. Moses and Joshua both learned, you do not approach God casually. They both began to move toward a manifestation of God in their day, and both of them heard God say, stop right there. Take off your shoes, because this is holy ground. Don't come a step further. Let me give you a picture of what casual in the kingdom might look like. Matthew chapter 22, this is the wedding parable. The parable of the wedding feast. Verse number 11 of Matthew 22, the king came into the room, that's Jesus, to see all of the people. He saw one man who was not wearing the right clothes for a marriage. And the king said to the man, here's another God question. How did you come in here, my friend? In other words, 
in what universe did you think it was okay to do this? Then he said this, you are not wearing the right clothes for a marriage. The man could not answer the king because, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the ages, there is one thing for sure. You and I are going to be silent. Well, I'm going to tell God this, and I'm going to... No, you're not. The king then said to his servants, tie his hands and his feet. Now, this is not looking good. Take him and throw him into the dark place outside. There people will cry and they will bite their teeth together. Some translation says that's where the weeping and the gnashing of teeth is. And that's not heaven. Now, let me give you a little background. What is the explanation to this parable? Well, the background is this. Any time in this day that a prominent person would hold a dinner, especially a wedding, they would provide for every guest their own clothes. This, it's, it's not a question of this man didn't have the right clothes. He chose not to change his clothes. He said, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. I'll be okay like this. This is what I want to wear. This is more comfortable for me. It, it's a bit casual, but it's okay. And the king said, what? universe did you come from to think that this would honor me? Approach. We have in so many ways lost the approach side of the kingdom. We assume that God is as casual as we are. And that would be a grave mistake. When we approach the holy as ordinary, lesser things then become more holy to us than the holy, eventually leading to our demise. You see what I mean? Well, most of the time, I honor him, but just, you know, these, these kind of things, they become more holy. Not literally, just to us. A, approach. B, behavior. Do you know that the greatest power that you and I have is the power to choose? God put it all on the line in the garden when he gave man the power to choose. Because that means that man could say yes to this and no to that. He could choose this way or that way. He could go here or he could go there. And that means that man could end up in places where he didn't belong. Behavior. Behavior is knowing where I belong and where I don't. And let me just tell you, the one place that you and I do not belong is first. We are never first because Jesus Christ is first and last. When Jesus spoke to some people on the road one day, he's pointed his finger to him and he says, follow me. And do you know what the guy had the audacity to tell him? Well, there's something that I want to do first. 
Let me first do this. Oh, I'm going to first do that. You know what that means? That means that Jesus is not first. He's first, but not here. You see, most of the time, He's first. But there's sometimes when I have an option, I opt to choose. I exercise my option. I'm going to do this first. I'm going to do this instead. I am going to go this way. Uh, I'm going to go that way, but I'm going to go this way first. You know what Jesus said to them? Oh, I get it. You want to be first. You want to go first. Bye. There's no room for you because there's already a first. And there can only be one first. The one place I do not belong is in the front. He's my leader. And modern day Christianity in this country has given us another option. Well, you can be first some of the time because God understands. Where is that in the Bible? These are choices. This is called respect for God. A couple of guys should have known better. In fact, they were doing really well. They were handling all the things of God and nobody died. Now that's good. Two of the sons of Aaron decided one day, you know what, we want to just mix it up a little bit. We're going to do things our way. We don't really need to go get that fire over there. We just make our own fire and take it into the Lord. Because God understands it's a long way. We're just going to do that. Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 1, Nadab and Abihu were two of Aaron's sons, but they disobeyed the Lord by burning incense to him on a fire pan when they were not supposed to. It was not the incense that was the problem. It was the fire. They brought their own fire. It was not holy fire. Because you see, when we cease to see the holy as holy and it becomes ordinary, then my fire becomes just as holy. Here's the rest. Anybody want to read the rest of this? <laughs> suddenly, oh, suddenly, the Lord sent fiery flames and burned them to death. And Moses told Aaron that this was exactly what the Lord had meant when he said, I demand respect for my priest. When did God say that? When did God tell Moses, I demand respect for my priest? He told him on Sinai. He said, Moses, go down there and warn my priest. By the way, welcome to the priesthood. He said, you warn my priest. Do not. Do not put your foot where it does not belong. Do not lay hold of what does not belong to you. Do not usurp and take what is not yours. Don't go any farther than the boundary because the glory of the... God says, my glory will come and it's not going to be pretty. Behavior. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. The priests have really hurt my teachings. And I will tell you, this could be spoken across our nation today. The priests have really hurt my teachings. They don't treat my holy things right. They don't show they are important. They treat holy things the same as things that are not holy. They treat me as though I am not important. Just in case you want the address again. It's Ezekiel 22, 26. Yes, it's in the Bible. A, B, C. Conviction. I know you know this. We live in a culture of disrespect. There are at least two or three generations in the United States who have no idea 
what a culture of respect looks like. That's how far back you have to go in our history. You see, it used to be whether you were raised in a privileged environment or in a very needy environment, whether you came from a mansion or whether you came from a tenement house, the one common value that everybody had growing up was this. They had a value for respect. That is no longer the case. Respect is no longer a common value in our world. You say, Pastor Buddy, is this a social studies course? No. The enemy loves disrespect because when people come into the kingdom, they also bring with them the absence of their value of respect. And they don't even know. People don't even realize that they are in an atmosphere of disrespect because it is so pervasive and it is so widespread, and it is so common, people think this is just the way it is. In public, it's often hard to tell the difference between the children and the adults by the way they act. In the home, respect, or disrespect, should I say, is not often acknowledged, and it goes unanswered. I will say this to you. My grandchildren have a totally different value of respect than I do. My wife and I were raised in an atmosphere of respect. There were things that you said, oh, and there were things that you didn't. There was a way to treat your father and your mother, and there was a way you didn't. It was understood. As Paul says, I bear in my body the marks. So when people come into the kingdom, they're not bringing in a model of respect. They are not trained in respect. So everything is all equal. Authorities don't deserve any respect. Parental authorities don't deserve any respect. Leaders don't deserve any respect. The only thing you need to do is just respect yourself. And you fight your entire life just to respect yourself. Listen to what God said. Leviticus 19, 32. Show respect to the elderly and honor old people. And all of us said, mm. Why? Is this a lesson in manners? Is this a lesson in etiquette? Or is this a spiritual principle? Here's the rest of the verse. In this way, you show respect for your God. And then those four words that creep up every once in a while in the Scripture, I am the Lord. You know what I am the Lord means? Don't even think about crossing me on this. That's what that means. God says, when you respect in this level, you will then respect in this level. And if you don't respect in this level, you will not respect in this level. This is why respect has to be a conviction. I leave you with a God question. Numbers 12, 8. This is the day when you did not want to be either Miriam or Aaron. Numbers 12, 8. 
they had spoken against their brother Moses. And listen to what God said to them. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Wow. Ooh. Here it is. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God is looking for a church. He's looking for people who above all else will honor and respect Him. Not in the ways that we tend to consider disrespect. He says, I'm looking for people who will respect what I say. Who know where they belong and where they don't belong. Oh, I'm not first. I'm not in the front. God says, these are the people that I honor. I believe that this is the way forward for our house. So we are back where we started. Where is our fear? Where is my fear? God asked me that during the fast. He said, oh brother, it's going to go downhill from here, isn't it? Where is your fear? Because you can be very flippant. Well, I'll just do this. Doesn't matter. Doesn't hurt. God doesn't do anything anyway. He's not involved, so why should I be? That was the prophet. Where's my fear? That is a question that I need to answer. We'll give Solomon the last word. Ecclesiastes 12, verse number 13. The last and final word is this. Fear God and do what He tells you. And that's it. Fear God. Do what He tells you. And that's it. There is a verse that just came floating into my spirit. I have no idea where it is, but it says they have no fear of God in their eyes. Here's the rest of the verse. Eventually God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden intent, whether it's good or or evil. I needed to hear that. Because I began to presume some things. You know when you presume? That means you've stepped onto something that doesn't belong to you. I'm now in a place, a position that's not mine. I'm now trespassing. You know what happens to priests that trespass? Demise. Maybe you need to ask that question today. Where is my fear? God says, I'm looking for those who tremble at my word. Tremble. Who respect ultimate what I have to say. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. That this would appear to be the avenue that takes us from relationship with you to friendship in you. that allows you 
to trust us. We trust you. But you want to trust us. Today, maybe you need to find your place again. It's not some browbeaten, discouraged, depressed, downcast place. My place in God is an exalted place. But there's my place and there's His place. God, I ask you to help me to know the difference, to walk in complete liberty in all that you have given me with a keen respect of what is mine and what is yours. Maybe you've been exercising your option I'm going to exercise my option. I'm going to go first this time. I'm going to get out in front. I don't do it very often, but it's, it's what I want to do. Perhaps that's not overly wise. Perhaps we need to reconsider, regroup, to come back to ground zero again.